I invite you now to hear God's word from the eighth chapter of Paul's letter to the Romans. I consider that the sufferings of this present time are not worth comparing with the glory about to be revealed to us. For the creation waits with eager longing for the revealing of the children of God, for, for the creation was subjected to futility, not of its own will, but by the will of the one who subjected it, in hope that the creation itself will one day be set free from its bondage to decay and will obtain the freedom of the glory of the children of God. We know that the whole creation has been groaning in labor pains until now, and, and not only the creation, but we ourselves, who have the first fruits of the Spirit groan inwardly while we wait for adoption, the redemption of our bodies, for in hope we were saved. Now hope that is seen is not hope. For who hopes for what is seen? But if we hope for what we do not see, we wait for it with patience. For I am convinced that neither death nor life, nor angels, nor rulers, nor things present, nor things to come, nor powers, nor height, nor depth, nor anything else in all of creation will be able to separate us from the love of God in Christ Jesus our Lord. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Well, we've heard them all. We've used most of them at one time or another. After all, they are cliches for a reason. Well-worn phrases and, and oft-repeated aphorisms, words we might speak to each other, perhaps without much reflection or scrutiny. They come so quickly to our lips, often bypassing our minds on the way out. For the next three Sundays, as we journey through a time of both personal and collective grief, as we ask difficult questions of God, and as we are perhaps drawn to the greeting card platitudes that come all too easily, we're going to take a step back. We're going to wrestle with and, and reflect on what we say to one another in the most tender times. What we say to ourselves when it doesn't all add up. And how examining these words can lead us into a deeper, sturdier, and more authentic faith. I found that these cliches are particularly prevalent in times of distress and difficulty. This makes total sense. In times like these, times like these, we are all trying to find meaning in the struggle. Perhaps we're seeking words that, that, that tie a bow neatly around the grief and the pain and offer comfort in its place. And sometimes, frankly, we're simply looking for something to say. When the silence feels a little too heavy. With the best intentions, we repeat these phrases that, that, that must be true because they are ubiquitous. Must provide relief because they've been used before. Must be scriptural because they sound like something we might have read there. I want to be clear, my intention in the coming weeks is not to be critical or dismissive. Instead, I hope to offer an invitation to deep pools of trust 
beyond the shallow waters of forced optimism. I want to suggest that these difficult questions we ask in trying times can be pathways to the profound. Can open opportunities for mutual support and encouragement if we have the courage to explore them. They might help us hold faith together. So here we go. I remember several years ago standing next to a friend at a funeral home visitation. My friend's father had died tragically and unexpectedly, and in that moment he was obviously uncomfortable. He was struggling to maintain some energy to greet a long line of friends, neighbors, and strangers. He, he wanted to be anywhere else. You could see it in his eyes. While I was standing next to my friend, a, a, a neighbor approached and, and shook his hand. He politely thanked the man for coming to support the family when the man placed his hand on his shoulder and said, I know it's hard right now, son, but in time you'll see that this was all part of God's plan. The grieving son looked quizzically at this would-be comforter, thanked him, and then walked toward the exit in tears. What I saw in those tears and what I later heard in his voice was not sadness, but bewildered frustration, perhaps even anger. Now, I have no doubt that, that the objective of the visiting neighbor was noble. I have no doubt that he meant to bring comfort, and at one level he could be right. Maybe a day will come when, when this son will reflect on his journey of grief and find that, that God was walking alongside him through the valley. Still, the choice of words brought pain in that moment. The encouragement to see God's hand in the tragic death of his father was not helpful. In other words, the cliché did not hold in the context. Everything happens for a reason. Now those words might be true in the scientific realm of cause and effect, action and reaction, but that's not the way we use the cliche most often. Usually we say it in response to suffering. It's a close cousin to other phrases like, it was meant to be, it must have been God's will, it was all a part of the plan. We seek to bring comfort through the assurance that God has a purpose in every situation of suffering or tragedy. If you're like me, you've heard these phrases often lately. And I would imagine we can all sympathize with those who have spoken them. I know I can. When people are suffering and the cause is not clear, we cling to the belief that God has a purpose for that suffering, that, it, that it's a part of God's divine plan. So does everything happen for a reason? At the risk of being vague, I want to suggest that the answer is more complex than it might originally seem. Because life is more complicated than any bumper sticker theology or miracle peddling preacher would have us believe. At the end of March, Time Magazine published a piece by the preeminent New Testament scholar and Christian theologian N.T. Wright under this provocative title. Christianity offers no answers about the coronavirus. 
it's not supposed to. Wright responds directly to those who have been quick to tell us with, with great certainty why a global pandemic has upended life for the whole of humanity, a, a punishment, a warning, a sign. In the place of these illusions of certainty or searches for rational explanation, Wright commends instead lament. I must admit I was a little disappointed. I was hoping for, for some grand theological formulation or at least a, a new interpretation of these enigmatic biblical texts on the sovereignty of God in the light of inexplicable human suffering. After all, N.T. Wright is, is, is N.T. Wright. Instead, he takes us into the heart of our scriptural tradition. He reminds us that the picture of God we find there is more complex than we may have been led to believe. He writes, the mystery of the biblical story is that God also laments. Some Christians tend to, to think of God as above all of that, knowing everything, in charge of everything, calm and unaffected by the troubles in this world, but that's not the picture of God we have in the Bible. Reading his words took me back to that funeral home in South Georgia and to countless similar situations I've encountered in ministry and in life. What if we choose to begin not with explanation, but with lament? What if we acknowledged that airtight theories and pious platitudes tend to collapse under the weight of real life experience? What would be left for us to say or do if in this moment of great sadness we confessed that we limited human creatures cannot state with great certainty the reason for pandemics or earthquakes or forest fires or cancer diagnoses or tragic accidents? What if we chose lament? I return this morning to the eighth chapter of Paul's letter to the Romans because I find in his words the kind of, of searching and seeking that so many of us are engaged in these days. Paul writes with honesty and clarity about the suffering of this present moment, the groaning of creation itself, the visceral pain, the longing of humanity for healing and hope, the suffering of this present moment, not captured in that one moment Paul wrote those words, the suffering in this present moment is true in every present moment. Paul suggests that, that what we call hope cannot be hope if it is seen. That is, genuine Christian hope is grounded in something deeper, more profound than human explanation or simplistic rationalism. Christian hope is grounded not in optimism, but in the love of God. It is finally that love that survives when all else is torched by the fires of suffering or battered by the relentless onslaught of grief. Years ago, I found words in Wendell Berry's novel, Jaber Crow, that I have found a, a meaningful replacement for the cliches that only cover our discomfort. Berry writes, grief is not a force and has no power to hold. You only bear it. Love is what carries you, for it is always there, 
even in the dark, or most in the dark, but shining out at times like gold stitches in a piece of embroidery. That's the picture of God I find in Scripture. The God who comes in human form to live among us, to suffer with us, to suffer for us, the God who is both sovereign over all creation and who chooses the vulnerability and freedom, who gives to humanity the freedom to choose the path of life and hope and love, the God who would never intend evil and who could never stay away from those who suffer, the God who gives courage to the weak, strength to the suffering, hope to the hopeless, that's the God I know. As the old preacher in Marilyn Robinson's novel, Gilead, says, he will wipe the tears from all faces. It takes nothing from the loveliness of that verse to say that is exactly what will be required. Professor Wright closes his essay with these words. As the Spirit laments within us, so we become, even in our self-isolation, small shrines where the presence and healing love of God can dwell. On Wednesday morning, our Lake Fellows gathered virtually for a seminar with two physicians in our congregation and a hospital chaplain. Though the seminar had been planned months in advance, its timeliness struck all of us and informed the nature and content of our conversation. I asked these experts to help us in responding to the deep and difficult questions of suffering that all of us are asking now and some of us are receiving from others. Jim Lemons, a pediatrician, neonatologist, and professor, spoke of, of protecting the silence. Sometimes, he said, silence carries more than can be held by words. Emily Giesel, a palliative medicine specialist, shared how she describes her practice to the medical residents she teaches. I thought her description was wise, insightful advice for all of us to practice in this time. She said that she tells residents that the primary tool of palliative care is the chair. We sit down. We stay present. We don't rush through the pain. We listen. Then she described her practice as a crockpot process, not microwave cooking. I love that. The next time I am tempted to fill a silence with a glut of my own words, I'm going to try sitting down instead. I'm going to try breathing. When I want to explain and rationalize and put a band-aid on the pain of another to feel better about myself, I'm going to try to, to pull up a chair instead. I'm going to try to let the feelings and the struggles simmer rather than nuking them. Here's what I know, what you know as well. 
bad things happen, tragic things happen, devastating things happen, and often they elude easy explanation. Often they defy all reason and evade our understanding. To wrap an explanation around them with simplistic words about the will of God is to minimize the depth of suffering and mask the authenticity of our experience. So what what can we say instead? Once we honor the silence, I think we do well to listen to the words of Paul to affirm this truth. That God is not absent from our deepest pain. That nothing can separate us from God's eternal, unending love. Nothing. For as Dr. Giesel said on Wednesday morning, echoing the Song of Solomon, love is stronger than death. So I don't believe the reductionist notion that everything happens for an obvious reason. But I do believe in the movement of God's Spirit. I do believe in the certain presence of God when we are weakest and most vulnerable. I do believe in a God who can't stop showing up for God's people. I believe in a God whose will for us is to experience the fullness of life and the richness of grace. And in the end, I believe that hope will defeat despair and joy will have the final word because it is God's will that joy come in the morning. And beloved, I believe this. I believe it with all my heart. I rely on it every single day. I have staked my life on it. I cling to its truth, which is deeper than any convenient cliché. That love is what holds us. Holds us up. Holds us together. Holds us forever. Amen.